by far one of the most difficult obstacles to a loving and fruitful relationship with God is when he acts in ways that completely contradict our current human understanding of who he is and how we think he should work. If the Lord were to come to me today in these woods right now, and he were to say to me, now that you know the rest of the story. I'm standing here exactly where I hoped I wouldn't be standing. What would you rather have? Would you rather have September 11th, you and Lisa together in New Zealand? The story completely reconciles you're no longer subject to public disgrace. You're no longer confused about what I'm doing or not doing. My plane just left without me. Wow. Or would you rather have what's going to happen to you and what I'm going to reveal to you on September 23rd in the woods in Huntsville, Alabama? The answer hands down is, please God, give me September 23rd. For the last 12 years, I've seen God do the impossible over and over but I have never seen anything like what he was about to show me. Like a fireworks show, this was going to be a type of a grand finale, vindicating his hand. Here it comes, can't believe it, this is just so surreal. And his glory, in mine, the most perplexing of testimonies. <laughs> oh my gosh. You've got to be joking. Can you believe what you're seeing with your own eyes? I cried. This means Noah stayed in the ark for another 70 days after the waters had receded on day 300. Was all of this just the craziest coincidences I had ever seen in my life? Oh my God in heaven, I think I'm gonna pass out. Oh my God in heaven. Like my eyes deceived me, like seeing a person come back from the dead. God told me his plans. He said the ark would be for me, my wife, our sons, and our sons' wives. It took us several decades to build the ark, but that was after years of designing it, collecting supplies, and preparing the site. On May 9th, 2017, Right around the time it was becoming obvious that my then spouse was slipping more and more into apostasy and away from her once pure and sincere devotion to Christ, I reluctantly agreed to take a two-day trip with my parents to visit the Noah's Ark exhibit in the state of Kentucky. I say reluctantly because in my ministry, I have been rather outspoken against traditional Christian apologetics where you try to convince people to believe either based on fragments of visible evidence which they can see, or like Ravi Zacharias did, through rational-based arguments and so-called principles of truth. I'm not saying there are no exceptions, but I do not believe contemporary Christian apologetics creates anything more than intellectual professing Christians who live the rest of their lives entirely by sight never actually learning to live by the kind of real faith which pleases God. When your foundational faith was dependent on sight, so too, most likely, will be your living faith. The root always determines the fruit. Nevertheless, I thought the trip couldn't hurt and might even help keep her from drifting any further away into the darkness. I was wrong. Nothing she saw that day did any good at all to save her from her apostasy. She only fell further and further into the dark until eventually she was totally gone. So right now it is April 23rd, 2020. It is 4.06 p.m. Tyler and I have been in this house for 10 minutes and we came here and Persis is gone. Ironically, as a type of foreshadowing, I shot videos of displays showcasing Satan's initial deception of Eve and how he convinced her to rebel against God. Then, as if to almost complete the foreshadowed story, 
I unknowingly captured a video of her walking beneath a display which showcased the apostasy of Billy Graham's first evangelism partner, Charles Templeton, who also eventually fell away from his faith in Jesus Christ. As spiritually ironic as all of that was, that was not by any means going to be the most compelling providences of God in connection to that trip. Even after all the astonishing things I've seen God do in the last 20 years, it absolutely boggles my mind to look back on that trip today having no idea at the time that behind the scenes, God, by his astonishing sovereign power, was organizing into my life story and testimony something that would become even more compelling evidence for Noah and the Genesis flood than what can ever be seen at that Noah's Ark exhibit. It's one kind of evidence when man points to it, but it's a different kind completely when God points to it. Exactly four years, four months, and 14 days after that trip, I would experience the grand finale of all my faith in God and suffering for Him so far. In His loving mercy, He was going to bring about the total vindication of His most perplexing work in my life and ministry, including the fact that He had given me a second spouse only to allow her to fall away from Him and almost bring my entire ministry into total ruin. God's dealings with me over the last 20 years have oftentimes been so perplexing that literally thousands of comments have been made publicly calling me a false teacher, a sick and twisted man, a scripture twisting heretic, a serial adulterer, a wolf in sheep's clothing, a demon, and even Satan himself. I often felt so much pressure to defend God's dealings in my life so that new people who came to the channel looking for the truth wouldn't stumble. On September 14th, 2021, I gave up any right to defend myself before God. Lord, I just say, allow Satan to say whatever he wants to say about me from this point forward. I'm no longer going to speak a single word in defense of myself or in defense of the testimony. I'm, I'm setting it down, God. 10 days later to the day, on September 23rd, 2021, I would experience the most astonishing, powerful evidence I had ever seen anywhere on the internet or anywhere in my entire life of God's total, complete, sovereign control over all people, all circumstances, all spirits, and all time. Every once in a while, God steps into time and does something so astonishing that it silences all the good dustlings standing around shouting their high opinion, their lofty interpretation of doctrine, or their superior discernment of the person or event in which he is working. As fire removes the oxygen from air, so too his glorious power removes the prideful noise of human opinion. By the mercy of God, this has become one of those times. Oh my God in heaven, I think I'm gonna pass out. Oh my God in heaven. Oh my God. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. oh, my God, I cannot believe this, Father. <laughs> I can't believe I'm, 
Oh my God, but my eyes just saw. Like what my eyes just saw, like, I, like my eyes deceived me, like seeing a person come back from the dead. Please help me, show me, is there any video, is there any evidence anywhere in the world that you can show me greater than what you will see in this video? Hi, my name is Michael Criswell, and what I'm about to tell you before I show you is perhaps one of the most outrageous, sensational things I could think to possibly say to you, but it's true. And I'm getting ready to show you what I believe is the greatest provable scientific evidence of Noah's Ark and the Genesis 7 and 8 flood that covered the entire world that you can find in any video anywhere on the entire internet. And you're going to find it in the most unlikely, humbling, shameful of circumstances you could ever imagine. Now, let me share with you before I show you, please be patient. I know everybody wants to get right to what is it. You just have to hold on to, in order to understand how compelling and how amazing this story is that you're getting ready to see, I'm gonna have to first share with you a glimpse of God's already very perplexing and astonishing dealings with me in the last 20 years. Just a quick flyover. Um, after Michael moved in with us, we had talked about him seeing numbers and that was a way that God was communicating with him. They were literally parked one after another. I've never seen this happen. Three numbers, 922, 929, and 544. <laughs> it's incredible. 922, go in peace. Your faith has delivered you. Be free from suffering. 929, it will be to you according to your faith. Right and Bob there. and I kind of rolled our eyes when we first heard him say that. And sometimes I really have been wondering, is all these number things really from God? And I'll be honest, you know, when I told my wife about the numbers, she was like, ah, this sounds a bit dodgy. They would tell him either what to do, what not to do, comfort him. It was exactly what he needed every single time. But we still weren't convinced. We thought that could be a coincidence. Far well, none so far, it has to be how the Lord communicated with you through numbers. When I heard you say that, it was like, oh, here we go. But when 666 would show up more than one time, like two or three times in one day, Michael would come through the door and he would say, guys, be prepared. Something's going to happen. I saw 666 three times today. And it wouldn't be a half a day would go by when we would either get something in the mail from the attorney, from the court. It got to the point Bob and I could no longer deny that God was talking to Michael in a special language that we'd never heard of, and it was through these series of numbers. What he says to you comes to pass every time? And miraculously? Well, then I have no choice but to believe it's true and it's from God. For God does speak, now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it. Do you know that for the last 12 years, God has given me insight over and over again as to what was going to happen in my life and warned me before things happened or told me of blessings that were coming and they would come and this would happen over and over again. This was the most amazing evidence of God I had ever seen in my life. Something happened to her when she was a child and look at there, right there, 666, right while I'm filming this. 949 on the clock, 949 is the scripture. What's the scripture? Does he who implanted the ear not hear? Does he who formed the wow. eye not see? Wow. Sitting in the middle of that gigantic pond is now not only that one same bird, but he now has a mate. 422, I get in the car. I'm literally at the bank right now, right there. I have asked the Lord to provide the resources, which I do not have right now, without asking any human being. I will be there in 37 days. Incredible. Finally happened. One million views. What God said has come true. I am the Lord who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers. Even though two people have said this is impossible, that it can't be done, be it to us according to our faith. I think God is saying something and I told you what? What did I tell you? 
it might we might get some good news about the visa. Yes, after seven months, 21 days, incredible God is to be praised. This is a story I cannot wait to tell. Here we are. And we have seen God come through over and over and over, including the fact that these are the guys who God chose to build our tiny house. I'm so excited. Seeing them and picking up my son, Tyler, I saw 666 four times. This is a police officer standing outside talking to my ex-wife. Appear in court on Tuesday. Stand. So here we are right now. God has just answered the prayer, and now I know I don't have to do anything to def defend myself. And indeed, it happened today. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so, always trust Him. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for Him. This isn't me going to Bible school, getting a Bible degree. This is me been walking for 12 years with the living God, who oftentimes he's put his words into my mouth and astonishing things have happened. He's told me the future repeatedly in 2016. I'm in India and I'm warning people this. The mass shooting here, the mass shooting there. God is going to continue to turn up the heat. The foundations are going to be shaken. Do you feel the fear already? Because if you do, I'm telling you, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm telling you, there's a hardness going to come on this planet that you can't even imagine. And more and more natural disasters and more and more things. And what are you going to do when the very things you're trusting in and the people you're trusting in are not there anymore? In 2017, the United States of America, the year following. And more and more natural disasters. And we had the worst natural disaster hurricane season in the history of the United States and the greatest number of mass shootings shooting here, the mass shooting there. Do you feel the fear already? Because if you do, I'm telling you, you haven't seen anything yet. Shooting here, the mass shooting there. Do you feel the fear already? Because if you do, I'm telling you, you haven't seen anything yet. In 2019, I did it again and said this. You are going to have to suffer much more than you ever imagined coming soon. This world is going to get darker and darker and darker and darker if you think that this is dark. I told you in 2016, and I'm telling you now, things are going to get much worse. Was it just a coincidence that the first US COVID-19 death happened exactly nine months to the day after my warning? Is there any other evidence in my life story that shows this prophetic pattern of nine months to the day? My Lord's Gym franchise, which I opened on August 22, 2001, collapsed on May 22, 2002, exactly nine months to the day that I opened it. After giving the Lord a full surrender of my will on October 30, 2009, nine months later to the day, on July 30, she signed her petition to file for divorce. We got through the U.S. visa process and departed India on December 24th, 2016, exactly nine months to the day after we married. In between the dates of April 23rd, 2020, the day P left, and January 25th, 2021, the day this hawk and rainbow appeared, not including those two dates, in between them is exactly nine months to the day. But let me also tell you that the Bible says we have this power in jars of clay, worthless broken vessels to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. Nothing you're going to see in this video came from me, nothing. The reason why God has done this with me is because I am amongst the most pathetic of all weak people I know. I have a video coming out right after this. I hope you'll watch that will explain more about that. You see, Two times God has given me in my personal life, not prophesying anything that affects you in the world, two times God has given me dates. And you'll see this in the story, the grace to love again and I will come forth as gold at relentlessheart.com forward slash series. You can see, by the way, all of the events that you're gonna see in this video, 
Every single one of those stories you can see at relentlessheart.com forward slash series. You can see them in all their glorious detail and learn about this God I've been walking with and pleading with other people to humble themselves before and walk with, okay? But there's been two times that I wanna tell you, God's given me dates regarding something in my personal life that I spoke out publicly and I was wrong two times. But I was only wrong about the event. I was not wrong about the date. I prophesied in, I will come forth as gold, the dates, February 11th and February 12th. You'll see a little bit of that in this story. And I believed that my apostate wife would come back. She did not, but instead there was a miracle with the visa, another breaking of the quote, government law in order for God to intervene and do something incredibly important. That's a part of this story you're gonna hear. So I was wrong about what happened. I was right about the dates that God given me. Then in the series, The Grace to Love Again, I prophesied a date of September 11th. And this is a date that I believed that God was telling me that my wife, Lisa and I, my second remarriage, after you'll hear what happened in this story, my second remarriage was going to put me with my wife on September 11th. Once again, I was wrong about the outcome, right about the date. September 11th, the very first day that my tiny house, after traveling 8,000 miles across the ocean in the belly of a cargo ship, would land and spend its first registered day on New Zealand soil in Auckland, New Zealand, was September 11th. This shows that God has been speaking to me and gives me insights into the future, but yet sometimes in my personal matters allows there to be just enough of the jar of clay visible so that I will stay humble and no one will ever think any of this came from me. And then I want you to understand two critical Bible passages of scripture that are principles of which God deals, being the God of Hebrews 13, eight, never changing the same yesterday, today, and forever. In order for you to understand why God would do what I'm getting ready to show you, you have to really be able to camp out on and understand these two passages of scripture. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. When you understand these scriptures, you can look back even at Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, and you can understand a foundation of why God would do what I'm about to show you, and that is to plant the greatest evidence, provable scientific evidence of Noah's Ark and the Genesis flood being not just some fable, not just some myth, not just some legend, but an actual historical thing that God did in one of the most shameful wrappings and unlikely humble wrappings you could possibly imagine, my story as a Christian minister of having been divorced and remarried twice. There's almost nothing you could think of more shameful that God could wrap this incredible evidence of the flood in than in my personal story likened to exactly how he dealt with the Son of God, the greatest evidence of God that has ever existed on this earth, the greatest changing discovery that has ever been known on this entire earth is the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The greatest gift that God ever gave man was Jesus Christ. And what did he wrap it in? Did he send this into the belly of a princess, of nobility? Was he born in the bathroom in a five-star hotel? No, he was born in the humblest of wombs he could possibly find, no doubt in the life of somebody who would have been completely despised already by society all around her. In addition to this, that wasn't enough. God brought a level of scandal to that story in which to hide and plant the greatest thing that has ever happened in human history, the birth 
supernaturally of the Son of God into the womb of a very humble, shameful, accusable, scandalous womb of a 13-year-old Hebrew. But she was allowed to be seen as someone who perhaps had premarital sex. There could have been nothing more shameful to have happened at that time under Jewish law than for her to have been impregnated outside the law of marriage. And yet God was pleased to allow it to look like that for Mary for a time. Ah, and look at what God has done. And we can see from these bizarre, counterintuitive, contradictory to human reasoning ways of God, that God is pleased to use the shameful things, the weak things of the world to humble and shame the wise. This is a way of God. And this is exactly what you're going to see in this video. Now, to be fair, I wanna tell you that in the 10 plus years of ministry I've done, I have been outspoken against apologetics. I'm completely against it. I spoke out against Ravi Zacharias long before he fell from grace and was proven to be a false Christian and a serial adulterer for real, even though I've been accused of being that. And I have been outspoken against the idea that you can find a faith that pleases God through this end of a telescope looking up, through this end of a microscope looking down, or from this end of a shovel digging on the backside of Jerusalem somewhere. Right now, while you're watching this video, millions of people are watching or searching for compelling evidence all over the world of Noah's flood, historical facts regarding Jesus Christ, and old covenant teachings and principles and stories. Somebody torch. Yeah. Okay. Does this bit of melted mud brick authenticate the biblical story? Our first piece of evidence in the search for Joshua. People are all over the place looking and searching, and I have taught for years that this is foolishness. Now watch, the book of Romans says that creation has already given us evidence that God exists and that men are without excuse. This is long before there was anything known as paleontology, archeology, span geology, none of this stuff existed then. And God is saying there's already enough evidence everywhere, but nonetheless, the pride of men cannot help. Even people who call themselves Christians, cannot help but attempt to draw down God and evidence thereof into their level of human intellect. Rather than bringing their human intellect down, rather than bringing their spirits down, they attempt to bring evidence of God or God himself down to their level. This is displeasing to God. I'm gonna prove it to you in this story. Hebrews 11:1 1 says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Jesus Christ told Doubting Thomas, listen, okay, I get it. You believe because you have seen, but blessed, supremely happy, pleasing to the Lord is the person who has not seen and believes. The Bible says in Hebrews 11:6 that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists based on what? Based on faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11:1. 1. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. So when you go to try to ascertain an intellectual belief or proof of God through what you can see with these eyes, you've already started running the wrong race. I have been teaching this for years and I'm gonna tell you something. This story proves that what I'm telling you is coming from the heart of God. I've already just quoted scripture. You will see it. Men's pride compels them to try to figure God out. Men's pride compels them, even in the name of Jesus Christ, to attempt to make a name for themselves, to bring visible evidence down. They want to be the one to let it be their shovel that finds that compelling piece of evidence. They wanna be the one to make the scientific discovery. They wanna be the one to be able to report to you what they saw through the telescope. Men's pride, even if they haven't understood their motives, are corrupt. The Bible says the heart of man is deceitfully wicked above all things who can understand it. I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine, it says that. In order to truly understand God and know God, a person must be willing to bring down their intellectual pride. They must be able to bring down their human understanding. There is no way you're ever going to have a faith that is pleasing to God if your faith is based on what you see in a documentary, in an archeological dig, or some new scientific discovery. Because I'm telling you, I've been warning for years that a scientific discovery is going to come either in space or here on earth in the next couple of years that is going to seemingly completely disprove the Bible and make it look like all those who believe in it truly have believed in a fairy tale. 
There are people all over the world who have found really compelling arguments to believe either for the flood in Noah's Ark. And Christian, you met with one scientist who says there's actually proof that the great flood that took away Noah's Ark existed? Well, as you can imagine, historians, archaeologists, uh, discoverers are always trying to figure out were these stories true, what aspects of them were. Now, nobody really believes they'll ever find an ark. I mean, for obvious reasons, wood, decay, etc. But Robert Ballard, who found the Titanic shipwreck in 1985, believes that there is evidence of a massive flood about 7,000 years ago, which is when the Bible situates Noah's story, and he thinks it's in the Black Sea region of the... Or against it. Despite growing up with a picture of Noah's Ark on my bedroom wall, I would go 25 years of my life without ever studying the story's historicity. That was until one particular day, when my dad recommended that for my next public talk, I take a look at the outline, The Flood of Noah's Day Has Meaning for Us. A talk in which the number one objective is to convince the audience that the Flood was a real historical event. Over the next couple of months, I would go on to research every single drop of evidence put forward to support the Bible story as being historically true. when 666 would show up. And it's completely debatable still. There is nothing that you can show me or you that's completely irrefutable evidence. Just in fact, when people think they have found the Holy Grail of Noah's Ark or the flood, perhaps that piece of wood that was found on the top of Mount Ararat, years later, what happens to some of the greatest archeological discoveries, but they are found to be frauds. For example, Fernand Navarra claimed to have touched the ark and supposedly brought down from the mountain wood from the ark. However, when the wood was tested, it was far too young to be that of Noah's ark. And those accompanying him later revealed that Navarra carried the wood up to the mountain earlier and then brought it down to promote his book called Noah's Ark, I Touched It. And I tell you the truth, God has hidden all of these things that men try to search so hard for to prove God, he's hidden them on purpose because you cannot ascertain faith and, and belief in God outside of faith, being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. This is why Jesus Christ explained, no one can come to me unless they've been enabled. Faith is a work of grace upon the heart. When you and your pride sit down and do a video and say, you found after all your studies and Jehovah's Witness, there was your first problem, you were a Jehovah's Witness. You needed to get out of the cult first, not jump from the frying pan into the fire by saying that Noah's Ark and the flood don't exist. Men cannot help themselves. They're spending millions of dollars and years of their lives searching for evidence for the Bible, the flood, Noah's Ark, all kinds of things. And you know what? Almost all of them die with a question mark on their tomb. It may be just a smaller question mark, but none of them die with compelling evidence as having been the one who found it, having been the one who discovered the, the final, you know, the holy grail of archeological evidence of God. God has hidden all these things. Men are searching for the ark right now. The Bible says it won't be found. Men won't even give thought to it anymore. And men are still in their pride searching for it. They're searching for the holy grail. Even Hitler tried to find the holy grail. What does Jesus say? Jesus Christ says, do you wanna find the holy grail of faith? You wanna find how it is to live with me, be pleased with me, have my blessing upon your life, have an assurance of salvation when you die, knowing that in fact, I did die on a cross, I did shed my blood, I did die for the sins of the world, and that you can have eternal life. He said in John 7, 17, if anyone chooses to do God's will, which is to put his teachings into practice, which in verse 16, he says, do not come from him alone as a man, but come from God. He says, that person will find out. Isn't that the basis of geology? Isn't that the basis of archeology? span Isn't that the basis of astrology? That everybody's trying to find out. And you know what? They're trying to find out using this human intellect, the pride of man, I found it. I know, I'm the one. You can believe it now because you can see it. The only way Jesus says you will ever find out is if you pull down in humility your human intellect and you surrender it to God. You get on your knees before him and you give him that faith which is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. God is never going to be pleased with a faith 
that is found on the other side of a telescope, the other side of a microscope, or on the back side of a shovel. That is not the kind of faith that pleases God. And if your faith has been born that way, or if your faith is being established that way, your faith is being built on what you can see with your eyes, and I tell you, my friend, one day you're gonna see something with your eyes that will absolutely erase everything you've already seen that has led you to believe what you believe. You had better find out on the inside. You had better have a personal evidence such that if little green men that I've been warning about for 10 years, the program examined how major religions would likely respond if humankind encountered extraterrestrials. He asks whether Jesus, as understood by Christianity, is unique or could be one among many incarnations on different worlds. Landon tell you it's all a lie, this Bible business, this Jesus business, that they were an actually experiment 10,000 years ago. They did this to us and they are our creator. What do you have by finding out outside of some gigantic stone they think is from Noah's Ark or outside of finding one nail of the crucifix? Tens of thousands died on the cross. What most people don't know is this. Archaeologists have found nothing. Well, almost nothing to prove that anyone was ever crucified. How can this be? Like all good stories, let's start with a twist. A twisted nail. This is the only physical evidence in the world proving crucifixion happened. If your faith is being dependent upon these little tiny things or what they're going to find, when they do all the sonar stuff under Noah's Ark, as absolutely amazing and compelling as it is, that is not going to lead to a faith that will save you. You're fooling yourself. The only faith that will save you is the faith that be, is absolutely sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. This comes from humility. It comes from the denial of self, which starts with the denial of intellect. I'm not asking you to be an idiot. I'm asking you to believe what Jesus Christ said, that if you give him faith, you will find out. If anybody ever were to come to me as an unbeliever and ask me, how can I prove God to them? The greatest evidence I've always had is the miracle of who I once was and who I am today. And I would show them, you wanna see the greatest evidence I can ever show you of God? Look at this heart and then look at this heart. I, I have such a, a, a sickening pride and this, this lust for the approval of men and, and, and standing on stage in front of hundreds of people like I'm some kind of a great, you know, speaker and, and, and the focus on the money and the things and, and, and I see my attitude and who I am and that person and it, it just, it breaks my heart to see who I am apart from Jesus Christ. That's the greatest evidence that I can ever show people to show I found out. Now look at what God did. God took it a step further. I've given him faith. I humbled myself like a child as we are all called to do, Matthew 18, three through four. Unless you humble yourself and change and become like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to humble yourself. You cannot take your giant intellect and go to God and think you're gonna figure him out and prove him or disprove him. He will not allow it to happen. You will die just like every other person who's died in history with just a, maybe a smaller little question mark on your tombstone. You never really truly found out. The only way to find out is by faith in Christ. I wanna make that clear. It is the pride of men that prevent them from doing what I'm telling you. It is your pride that will say to you, ah, yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that, those, those guide stones, this, that, the other, this, that, the other. It's your pride. What of the very best Christians that have ever lived who never saw the first instance of the idea that Noah's Ark ever discovered, was ever discovered? What of the greatest Christians who've ever lived who've never had the benefit of understanding the geological curves and the, and the geology structures around the world and understand all the scientific stuff about the flood? What of them? They had the faith that believed in spite of what it didn't see and they were pleasing to God and God made them fruitful. Nevertheless, I want you to stick around for part two. I'm gonna show you now, just bear with me. We're gonna go through the story. I'm gonna to explain to you how this happened. I'm gonna share with you the story. And then in part two, I'm gonna to explain to you some of the insights that God has given to me about why he has done this, why he's connected this to the flood. And there's gonna be some remarkable things that you'll see towards the end of the video. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes to watch this. And I would just challenge you, honestly, put it in the comments section. If you can point to anything in a more humbler set of circumstances, a greater evidence of God than what you will see in this story, if you can find me any greater evidence of Noah in the flood anywhere, please post it and show me. I do not believe you will be able to find anything that is this riveting, this compelling, and I do not believe you're even gonna be able to get your head wrapped around this. 
This is extraordinary. And may God richly bless those of you who humble yourselves as a child before him when you watch this, because in the times of terrible uncertainty we're facing and the ever increasing times of uncertainty that will come, this is something absolutely rock solid. If you think it took a lot of power for Noah to be able to build the ark, how much more power has it taken God to be able to put this story inside my life? May God bless you richly as you watch this. In 2016, I flew to Hyderabad, India to marry my second spouse after waiting for five and a half years for his promise. It might not be too much of a stretch to say that God had similar plans for my ministry that he did for the prophets in the Bible known as Hosea and Ezekiel, where he used either their wife's infidelity or their death to show the Israelites how wicked they had become. I've had the very painful experience as a full-time minister for the Lord Jesus Christ of having been married three times after losing my first two wives to infidelity, hypocrisy, and apostasy. So right now it is April 23rd, 2020. It is 4.06 p.m. Tyler and I have been in this house for 10 minutes and we came here and Persis is gone. The combined total of both of those relationships was exactly 21 years to the day. But wait a minute, Stuart, I've got a question. If God knew that Gomer was gonna be unfaithful, then why would he have Hosea marry her? Especially because you said that he was a good man. God wanted Hosea to understand him. I mean, that's the key here. He wanted Hosea to love so deeply, knowing that it would never be returned. Why, why? 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 Why, Lord? Why? 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 I've also had the scandalous experience of being asked by God to make all the details of these stories known before hundreds of thousands of people. I became outspoken against the severely out of balance, God hates divorce message and the you cannot remarry while your first spouse is still physically alive messages. I began pointing out the teachings on divorce in the Bible that even famous ministers like John Piper and David Pawson were not. Hundreds of thousands of people watched my teachings and many began to get free from Satan's lies and the bondage he was keeping them in, often to a child of the devil. See 1 John 3, 6 through 10. And uh, I begged her to start praying and seeking him. And I don't know that um, she was totally willing to fully give herself to God and, and give us another try. I started going on YouTube and trying to find out videos on marriage and how God could save my marriage. And I came across uh, this video that said, don't be surprised if God runs off your unbelieving spouse by this guy named Michael Criswell. And uh, I, I turned it on. I actually played it for about two or three minutes. And I got so angry because I, I could tell the context of this video was not what I wanted to hear. Ironically, God was not only severely testing me, his servant, but even more so, he was testing all my hearers. Similar to the suffering of end times, this story was going to find you out, proving if you had oil in your lamp, the true grace of God in your heart. I would be really upset that someone would blatantly lie to try and hurt another human being. And I would be very angry and didn't feel forgiveness in my heart at all. And when I would talk to Michael about it, his response was always the same, Mom, we have to forgive. We cannot carry the bitterness in our heart and remember what he says. Forgive them for they know not what they do. I run into quite a lot of people today who want to claim to be prophets, but I'm not sure that they're following the scriptural pattern because there's nothing very glamorous about being a prophet according to the Bible. 
It's painful. It means isolation, persecution. God was testing people to see if they could keep following me as I followed the Lord. Could they persevere with me and carry their own cross? Were they an overcomer? Could they keep walking with me by faith and not by the sight of circumstance, which so often completely contradicted the notion that God was with me? Michael's message about Persis falling away. The situation with Persis. The enemy really used the Persis situation when um, Persis started to walk away from the faith. The initial thought I had was, oh, maybe the Lord isn't really with Michael. At one time, there were tens of thousands anxiously waiting for the next message, just like with Jesus. But by the time my second spouse went apostate and abandoned the marriage, there were only a few thousand left, and God only knows how many of them were sincere. Many walked away offended or sad, like the rich young ruler, unable to continue the self-denying, cross-carrying, world-hating narrow path which leads to life. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. God often uses his bizarre dealings with his servants to test their hearers. Abraham being asked to sacrifice Isaac still tests all of us today. Moses' choice of a wife tested Aaron and Miriam. David on the run from Saul tested his men. Hosea's marriage to an adulterous wife tested the Jews. The apostle James being killed by Herod tested the disciples. And so did Paul's frequent visits to jail. The greatest example is found in the Lord himself. God did all kinds of miracles through Jesus, and many thousands of people were entertained and excited at first. A large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing the sick. But soon, the people stumbled over the narrow path, his poverty, his homelessness, his lack of political power, his demand for obedience, his breaking of the Sabbath, and most vividly, his cross and crucifixion. Even before the final humiliation of the cross. This is the very reason I told you that no people can come to me unless the Father makes it possible for them to do so. Because of this, many of Jesus' followers turned back and would not go with him anymore. So many had stopped following Jesus that the disciples had to ask more than once, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God smitten by him and afflicted. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. But just as God did not leave Jesus in the shame and humiliation of his public cross, God was not going to leave me on mine. This story will now be to the great blessing and glory of those who clung with me to God's faithfulness and who never gave up. I am so proud to call them true brothers and sisters in Christ. And to one of them, I am so very blessed and extra proud to call her my wife, Lisa Criswell. After following the ministry for five years, sticking with me through thick and thin, Lisa reached out to me via email in my darkest moment, being fully persuaded that God was still with me and that he most certainly had a resurrection for me. God found her faith to be so genuine that he gave her to me as my wife to replace the one who had rejected both he and I. You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. So after my plane left without me on August 25th, and I missed our wedding, knowing that the borders in New Zealand were closed because of the COVID lockdown, I seriously began praying that God would translate me to my wife in New Zealand. 
As foolish as it may sound, I wasn't asking him to do something that he hadn't already done before. Not only had I found seven instances of translation in the Bible, but I also discovered that it had happened to an extraordinary Chinese Christian brother and fellow minister named Brother Yun, who is still alive today. Because I knew Yu Jing Chai was probably waiting for me in my house, I decided to run home so that he wouldn't have to wait long for me. As I ran, I recited Bible verses out loud and didn't pay much attention to where I was running. Suddenly, even though I didn't feel anything or notice anything happen, I found myself entering my home village without any time passing. What should have taken a few hours took just a few moments. This experience is difficult to explain, but it was unforgettable. I believe God performed a miracle like that when he translated Philip in the book of Acts. The Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. I said, God, if you can do it for Brother Yun, why not me? Father, doesn't this world need to see an amazing display of your power like this amidst all the darkness and spiritual confusion in the world? As hard as it would have been for me to imagine, God was going to show his power in an even bigger and much more verifiable way than if he had simply translated me to New Zealand. People could doubt that. They cannot doubt this unless they are dishonest. Does the hand of God really intervene? Not just in matters of life and death, but also in the ups and downs of our daily lives? Or does everything that happens happen by chance? What are you doing? I'm looking for streaks. Streaks? Yeah, if you flip a coin enough times, you're gonna get a streak. Really? That's a lot of tails. Well, if I flip a coin twice and I get heads both times, is that miraculous? Uh, no. How rare does an event have to be before we would call it miraculous? One in a million, one in a billion? I'll choose billion. All right, one in a billion. Well, let's try something. All right. Jack of diamonds, mm -hmm. six of spades, yeah. king of spades. Mm -hmm. Two of hearts, seven of diamonds, and ace of spades. Is it miraculous to have gotten this sequence? No. I mean, it's just, just a random selection of cards off the deck. Well, right. But this particular sequence, starting with the jack, yeah. and then getting the six of spades, and then king of spades, it only happens one in about 14 billion times you draw six cards. So it's pretty miraculous by your one in a billion standard. So you're telling me that this is miraculous? Well, no, as you said before, it's just a random set of cards. What if it was first six digits of your social security number? What if it were the last six digits of your social security number? The first six digits of your phone number? Sometimes it's not actually miraculous. Sometimes it's just probability playing its uh, tricks on you. All right, so how do we include the divine? Because there are people who really do think that there is divine intervention in these kinds of interplays. Absolutely, and nothing I'm saying here rules out the possibility of the divine. The fact that probability predicts certain things doesn't mean that there can't be divine intervention. But miraculous things that are so unlikely that you think it can't happen by chance alone, they do happen, and they have to happen. It would be odd if they didn't, because with six billion people in the world, there are so many opportunities for something really unusual to happen. We would expect it to happen to some of them. Mm. It's human nature to make a symphony out of the cacophony of events going on around us doesn't mean that divine providence doesn't exist. Dear Professor Oppenheimer, now let's suppose you walked out of that coffee shop and you walked to the first business next door. You asked them for a deck of cards and you drew the exact same set of cards you just drew in front of Morgan Freeman. Would that be random chance? What if you went home and drew the exact same set from your personal deck a third time? Would that still only be random chance? What if five years later you moved 600 miles away and drew the same six cards from a new deck? Now, suppose you moved out of the country five years later, perhaps to New Zealand. Upon your arrival, you drew from a completely new deck of cards the exact same set of six cards. Now, 
let's add one more constraint. On the fifth time you drew the exact same set of cards in New Zealand, you learned that the six cards drawn from the very first set of cards ever made by the first person to invent them was the exact same six cards you just drew five times in a row over a 10 year period. Is that random probability and chance or an intervention of God's divine power? If you can imagine how unlikely something like that would be to happen apart from divine intervention, how could you possibly imagine what you are about to see happen by random chance? It is impossible. Even though most of what we see in the lives of the people in the Bible is chaotic and messy, the Lord leaves clues all throughout the Bible and in their lives to show that He is in control and working purposely through it all. You cannot read the Bible and not see that God is a God of numbers. You can scarcely find a single significant event in the entirety of the Bible that does not have a number attached to it. God signs his most important work with precise dates and time periods to remove any possibility of suggesting it happened by random chance or by the doing of men or devils. Looking at just the numbers 7 and 40, both of which indicate a time of completion, the number 7 appears 338 times and the number 40 appears 105 times in the Holy Bible indicating many events done in a precise, complete amount of time. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Among the gods, there is none like you, O oh Lord, no deeds can compare with yours. Today is December 24th, 2016. Nine months ago today, I flew into Hyderabad, India, where I'm at right now. Important note, I have been carefully documenting my entire life and walk with God in great detail since 2009 and sharing it publicly since 2011. There is not one significant dated or timed event in this story that is not verifiable by either electronic documentation, video or audio recordings. We've landed in Detroit, Persis is standing right behind me waiting with our bags. We've gone through customs. We Personal eyewitness testimony. You've got to be joking. Or the thousands of witnesses who have followed the entire story online as it happened in real time. Let them know that it is your hand that you, O oh Lord, have done it. I first began to wonder if God was intentionally orchestrating all the major events of my life in very precise amounts of time 20 years back in 2001 when I realized that my Lord's Gym franchise, which I opened on August 22, 2001, collapsed on May 22, 2002, exactly nine months to the day that I opened it. Then I became even more convinced after giving the Lord a full surrender of my will on October 30th, 2009. Nine months later to the day on July 30th, she signed her petition to file for divorce. In 2010, he spoke to me about firing my divorce attorney to trust him alone. He ended my divorce with a miraculous victory on the 777th day, and then he pointed me to page 777 of my Bible, where it basically told the story of exactly what he had just done. Then in 2016, I obeyed his leading to remarry after five and a half years. I landed in Hyderabad, India. Here I am, welcome to India, it's official, I've made it. I can't even believe it. Okay, it's the 24th Thursday. It's about a little after midnight. We've just arrived in New Delhi. To marry her on March 24th, 2016. We got through the US visa process and departed India on December 24th, 2016, exactly nine months to the day after we married. This was the third major event he had done in my life in nine months to the day. 
On December 29th, 2017, I obeyed the Lord's command to order a custom-built tiny house trailer to build our home on. The trailer was manufactured on January 31st, 2018. I built the tiny house and moved it onto the land for the first time on August 9th, 2019, exactly 555 days later, a number that had played such a dramatic role in my first story, Trusting God in the Storm. So now I'm seeing the 666. Well, I started seeing another number, 555. And God says, look at page 555 in your Bible. So I quickly turned to page 555 in the Bible and I read the story of Jerusalem's deliverance foretold. And as I read that story, God said, I'm telling you in advance, I'm going to deliver you. Then on April 20th, 2021, I sat on a bench in the backyard of my dear friends, Jared and Kristen Tabai in Austin, Texas, and announced that I had received the final confirmation from the Lord that I was to let my second spouse go and that the Lord already had another wife for me. I knew that I had to do this video on that day, but I didn't realize until perhaps a few weeks after that it had actually been done exactly 777 days since she first separated from me on March 5th, 2019. This was the second 777 day major event God had done in my life. I'm a spiritual widow. I have lost two wives because of my love for Jesus Christ. No other reason. Brothers and sisters, I am going to be married again. I know that I'm going to be married again. I rejected the idea. I said, oh, I'll never marry again. I'm never gonna go through this. No, I'm gonna do it. And God has already shown me it is, it is His will. And there are truly too many of these occurrences to list. And we keep finding new ones, like the most recent ones regarding the tiny house. In prayer on June 23rd, 2021, my wife Lisa was in prayer and the idea of us bringing the tiny house to New Zealand would not leave her mind. You know, and she said, this could just be me, but I've been in prayer about this and I couldn't get this thought that came out of my mind about the tiny house, about what if you're still supposed to bring it to New Zealand? That day, we began praying about God sending us a $40,000 fleece to let us know if he truly wanted us to ship the house to New Zealand. Exactly five days later, the biblical number for God's grace, on June 28, 2021, we received notification of a $44,444 donation that was being made to us. The tiny house was towed away from my land to make its 8,000 mile plus journey to Auckland, New Zealand on August 2nd, 2021. So it's 744 on August 2nd, 2021 and the tiny house is gone. It just pulled out, it took two trucks. Exactly. 40 days to the day after Lisa had those thoughts in prayer that would just not go away. The first day of land preparation after the house was initially built and ready to be lived in was on July 27th, 2019. I then hired the cargo company to ship the tiny house to New Zealand on July 27th, 2021, exactly two years to the day from the first day of land prep. By far, my favorite two year to the date event so far has been regarding my wife, Lisa. God had obviously seen all my suffering for those 21 years at the hands of two unfaithful spouses and he had saved the best wine for last, John 2.10. Lisa emailed me a faith-filled email from New Zealand on March 5th, 2021 while my ministry was down. This was the email that caused me to take notice of her as a sister of real faith in God. This was exactly two years to the day from when my apostate spouse announced she would not be moving with me to New Zealand, but instead would be separating from me. Then the tiny house spent its first official day parked in Auckland, New Zealand port on September 11th, 2021, 
exactly 777 days from that July 27th, first day of land prep, which was also the same day my then apostate spouse told me she could no longer wait to move forward with a divorce. I recently discovered yet another instance of a 777 day time period in my divorce from Persis. My first attempt at granting her the divorce was on July 3rd, 2019. The judge signed a deficiency letter from the court on July 9th, 2019, based on the use of the word averse. I received this letter in the mail on July 12th, 2019. July 13th, 2019, 9.21 a.m. in the morning. The divorce papers came back that I've misdone something on the co divorce complaint. I need Our third and final attempt at divorce, yet another instance of three, was finalized on August 29th, 2021, the final divorce date. Sandwiched directly between those two dates, July 12th, 2019 and August 29th, 2021, not including those two dates, is exactly 777 days. If God's message to us was so dire, so vitally important, then why wouldn't he give it to us in such a clear and precise way so that we would all be in agreement, as evident as a simple math problem? This was the fourth major event the Lord had done in exactly 777 days. As evident as a simple math problem. However, the most astonishing account of God's sovereign control and timing of dates in my life was still to come. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. O Lord, renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. On August 9th, 2020, three months after she left, I was still so perplexed about how all this came into death after God did all that he did to put it together in the first place. I was reading my Bible and I began circling and counting the seven sevens and the six forties in the Genesis flood story in my Bible, reflecting on the bizarre fact that God had done every event in our marriage in India in periods of forties and sevens. Suddenly I thought, I wonder how many sevens and forties there were in it. I was in shock when I saw it was a perfect match to the account in Genesis. Here is a chronological list of the sevens and the forties in the Genesis flood story. And now you can see the chronological order of the sevens and forties in my second marriage. 40 months to the day of waiting for my promised wife ended on December 30th, 2015. Seven days later on January 6, 2016, she gave me her phone number. Seven days later on January 13th, 2016, I asked her to marry me. 40,000 sky miles were required for the first India plane ticket. 40 days after I buy the plane tickets on 212, the plane leaves on 322. Seven times she went to the Indian marriage registrar before God delivered us. 40 days after back in the United States from the first India trip on 420, 2016, I received a $500 gift for the next plane ticket on 529, 2016. Seven days after the $500 gift, we find a special Indian visa that will allow me to return. 40,000 sky miles were required for the second plane ticket back to India. Seven day turnaround time on my second Indian visa, which came back on June 20th, 2016. Seven days after arriving back in India, we received P's visa application notice. Seven months and 21 days was the processing time for her US visa. 40 months to the day from leaving India on 12 24 2016, she leaves on 4 23 2020.
Now, when you put together the sevens and forties in the Genesis account and the sevens and forties in our marriage, albeit not in chronological order, you can see we have a perfect match with not one single event missing. One thing that makes this providence of God even more remarkable is that they did not just happen without my willful active involvement. I had to be able to hear God's guidance to me and to obey the Lord throughout all of this in order for him to hit these dates. This shows that we have such a vital role to play in God's glory and how important listening, trusting, and obeying really is. Then things were about to get really weird before they got really amazing. How did I find all the animals? Well, it really wasn't hard to find the animals since God brought them right to me, just as he said he would. I just wondered when he would send them. We were nearly finished building the ark when hundreds of spectacular animals arrived. <laughs> I should have known. God's timing is perfect and he always keeps his promises. You know, the Bible has so many stories of God using animals in very perplexing, bizarre ways, making them actually do things that don't fit with their nature in order to accomplish his purposes. 30 minutes later, I'm walking back to my utter amazement. Sitting in the middle of that gigantic pond is now not only that one same bird, but he now has a mate. Wow, I'm just walking and I would have just gotten bitten by this rattlesnake right here. He's literally eating this other snake. Man, I, I got so afraid, I, I it shocked me. I was in the middle of making a message about this evil thing that's just happened with my children. This is a message to make a track record. Oh, isn't that amazing? Here's a snake, big black snake as I'm walking by just now making this message. Wow, that's not a coincidence. Wow, that's amazing. Whew. Thank you, Jesus Christ. I saw 666. And now I'm sitting here looking at this beautiful hawk that I just went out and filmed and I got up to about maybe six or seven feet away from him and he's not moving. And I'm just realizing how unnatural that is. That's amazing. I'm not sure why you just allowed me to do that. And over the years, I've seen many bizarre things where I know that God was using an animal in some way to send a message to me, to warn me, to communicate to me, to, to be a sign a pointing to something. Oh my God in heaven, the Lord just spared me again. I cannot believe this. I'm sitting here walking down the trail and I am going through scriptures looking for God's promises and I almost stepped on this rattlesnake. He is laying right in the middle of the trail. Look at this. Right in the middle of the trail. So it's 2.42 p.m. on 1.25-2021. And this hawk is still sitting out here. I've just gone out and shot nine minutes worth of 4K video and he's not going anywhere. I got so close to him and I, I'm sitting here thinking about how unnatural this is. I also saw the rainbow that I've never seen before today that was all across the bottom of the mountain. I just happened to look out the window and there was this rainbow literally from one end of the mountain to the other. And it happens on, of all days today. You know, there's just something, I don't know, there's some kind of like, it's like a sign. Here it was three days after the 22nd of January, a date the Lord had prophetically pointed me to weeks earlier. More on this later in the story and on which I was hopeful my apostate spouse would return. Plus, after seeing the rainbow, God led me to Genesis 9, 15 through 17, as if to personally promise me that he would never again allow all things to come into death in my life again. At this very time, I still hadn't made the connection between our marriage and the death of the flood story in Genesis 7 and 8, so none of this quite made sense to me yet. Then. While editing this video, 
I discovered that in between the dates of April 23rd, 2020, the day P left, and January 25th, 2021, the day this hawk and rainbow appeared, not including those two dates, in between them is exactly nine months to the day. Bye-bye. I don't know why you let me do that, but that was enjoyable for me. I hope it was enjoyable for you. That's amazing. I'm not sure why you just allowed me to do that. From the east, I summon a bird of prey to fulfill my purpose. Isaiah 46, 11. But ask the animals, and they will teach you, or the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. Job 12, 7 through 10. I came across this skull and I thought, wow, look at this, you know, and immediately I wondered if it had some meaning to it. Well, in making this video, looking for old videos on something else, I came across a video in the woods where I'm saying, oh, wow, look, here's a buck. You rarely see him. Good morning. Hi. He's looking at me. I got to be careful. Good morning. Yeah, he's a big old boy. What was so incredible to me is that as I watched that video, I began to recognize that this deer that I'm holding in my hands, what's left of him, is that actual deer in that video. Yeah, he's a big old boy. Yeah, look at that big old boy with his proud root. No need to run. You're okay. Yeah, you're all right. Yeah. Yeah, you're okay, buddy. You're a handsome boy. Yeah, you're handsome. Good morning, dear. Good morning. Hi, hi there. Yeah, you're a handsome boy. Look at you. Video, And I thought to myself, what are the chances of me even seeing this deer to begin with in the wild? Much less having caught a video of him, much less happened to come across his dead skull when he is dead. I thought, wow, that really makes you wonder. And so I've had all these things that have made me wonder where I've seen animals, snakes and hawks do things that don't make any sense. But look at him, he's not rattling or anything. I would have just totally walked right up on this guy. So clearly I see God is doing something here. He's making a sign and a symbol. But I tell you, the one that has made me wonder the most, the one that has been the most exciting evidence of God using animals in my life as a sign is definitely Esther the chicken. And so here I have these eggs I've just taken out of the refrigerator and inside these eggs, you'll notice there's three fresh raw natural eggs here. These have come from the chicken we now affectionately refer to as Esther. So these two eggs, or one of these two eggs, are the two eggs that I picked up on video in real time. Um, oh, look at there. She's been putting eggs in there. How about that? You guys got to see me get my first fresh eggs. Check that out, huh? On the video that I posted on YouTube on July, I'm sorry, June 28th. This egg was the last egg she laid, which was the next morning. So the, basically the first day she became mine, after that she no longer laid any more eggs. And so this egg came 12 days ago. That's the last time she laid an egg. And so this morning I've gone out here and I'm just gonna capture this. So basically this is where she sleeps. And I put her in here every night and you can see right there where she's kind of roosting and nesting there and there's no eggs and there hasn't been for 12 days. So I just have found this very, very bizarre that this chicken of all things wanders into our yard and she'll probably be over here under the truck and then she only gives three eggs and then quits. There's something very symbolic about this. I've made journal entries about this. I just cannot stop thinking that there's something significant about this. And uh, I even had this bizarre thought like, wow, I wonder if she's going to lay an egg again when Persis comes back, if God's doing some kind of a really interesting sign. 
and uh, but I'm, I'm just not sure I don't know there's just these threes that are popping up today will be day 13 and she's not laid an egg today is July 11th 2020 so I'm just gonna keep a little track record here and no egg I still believe that these three eggs that were given were a sign so today is like day 13 and I am just convinced that there is something to this. I forgot also to check for the egg this morning. Wow, yep, no egg. It is 6.55 in the morning on July 23rd. Today is day 90 that my wife has been gone. And, uh, to my disappointment, there's no, there's no egg. I don't know why I have this feeling about this egg thing. It seems so foolish, but I'd rather be a fool believing God than somebody who's got it all together and not trusting God. Oh my goodness gracious, today is September 20th, 2020. I'm starting to cry, I don't wanna cry over this. Today is September 20th, today's day 150 and I just opened and there's eggs in here. What did, what, did, what did you just say when you saw those eggs in there? You've got to be joking. Can you believe what you're seeing with your own eyes? I cried, Tyler. I began to cry when I looked in there and saw that she was sitting on them, Tyler. Man, wow. Those are her eggs. There had already been a perfect match between our India marriage and our U.S. visa process with all the 40s and 7s in the Genesis flood. But I had no idea that God was going to continue making connections to the flood. You can see here we have another match between the 150 days in which the flood waters prevailed on the earth and the 150 days between my spouse leaving and Esther the chicken suddenly laying her next eggs. Having seen this, I knew that no matter what happened, God was in control of this entire process. At some point, Isaiah 59, 19 came to my mind, where in the King James Version, it says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, think Noah's flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. After she left, he continued to lead me to passages of scripture about trusting him about resurrection, and about not being put to shame. I produced a documentary style video called Full Circle Faith about my confidence that God was going to bring her back. I'm just thinking about how many times I've been walking up this mountain and how many times I've been out in my prayer field and the temptations have come upon me to quit, to give up. To... Today is the end of three years of waiting for my wife to come back to faith. I'd like to tell you a story. If I don't come through this with my wife coming back to Christ and coming back to me, then I don't see any logical reason at all for you to ever listen to another word I say. Even saying that I was so confident that he told me she was going to come back that if she didn't, no one should ever listen to me anymore, but should consider me a false prophet. It was watched 160,000 times in just 60 days. In the seventh chapter of Job, we see that Job also foolishly conjectured where he told God that he would never see happiness again and that soon he would be no more. David also foolishly conjectured that he would one day be killed by the hands of Saul. See 1 Samuel 27, 1. And so too, I foolishly conjectured that if my wife didn't come back, that I was a false prophet and my ministry was finished. We were all wrong. God had an ending that none of us could have possibly imagined. And it involved not just God hitting precise dates or time periods, but hitting the precise time periods tied directly to all the rest of the dates and times in the Genesis flood of Genesis chapter seven and chapter eight. On January 2nd, 2021, the Lord led me by his providence to the date of January 22nd, 2021, 
the full details of which can be heard at relentlessheart.com forward slash series, I will come forth as gold. I had seen lots of confirmation pointing to that date, and I even felt peace to share it publicly in the journal entries. The main date that you hear me mention that was a crisis date for me that I banked everything on was the date of January 22nd. When January 22nd came and went with nothing happening, I was very perplexed because I knew I had heard from the Lord. Within a few days, he led me to two passages of scripture, both of which were connected to the January 22nd date. 2 Samuel 24, 8 indicated a time period of nine months and 20 days, which from the day she left on April 23rd, 2020, was February 11th, 2021. And the other scripture, Daniel 10, 12, indicated a delayed answer to prayer on the January 22nd date by another 21 days, which was February 12th, 2021. Persis and I needed to be in Montgomery, Alabama on February 8th because this was done via marriage. She came over here via marriage that I must be in attendance at this meeting on February 8th. It comes to February 8th and I allow it all to go into death. Persis never contacted me. I waited till the very last minute. It never happened. I was convinced that he had given me these dates as to when she was going to come back. Both dates came and went without anything happening that I could see. Then, on the third day, February 13th, I was startled and mystified while making a journal recording in the woods. This was all about God. Do this for your glory. Because... Oh my goodness gracious. This was exactly 40 days before our fifth wedding anniversary. I shut down my ministry of 10 years out of integrity to my word on February 19th, 2021. On February 16th, three days after that large dead tree fell, as a type of resurrection, I received her green card congratulations letter in the mail, but I didn't yet realize this was a sign from the Lord. Nine months and 20 days. Remember that number that God gave me, right? date stamped postmarked on that day which is february 11th 2021 i receive in the mail a letter from the department of homeland security i open up this letter and to my shock it says congratulations you are now a permanent resident of the united states of america there's the nine months and 20 days even more amazing 21 days in accord with the Daniel 10, 12. From what date? January 22nd, which was nine months to the day Persis left. The very number that God guaranteed me I would be delivered on. Nine months and 20 days, February 11th, postmark the congratulations letter to my amazement. Days later, I receive another mail and I open it up. And to my amazement, Persis's green card was printed and stamped and created on February 12th, 2021. Daniel 10, 12, 21 days later, God supernaturally, without my involvement at all, completely resurrected this visa and hit the two exact dates that he had promised me over and over. From April 23rd, 2020, the day she left our home, to February 16th, 2021, the day that congratulations letter arrived was exactly 300 days. Matching the 300 days, the floodwaters were on the earth in Genesis 7 and 8. This date signified the day the floodwaters of death had finally receded. I then separately received her green card in the mail on February 23rd, 2021, exactly 10 months to the day from when she left on April 23rd. On February 27th, 2021, 
God opened my eyes to finally see that I was wrong about being totally wrong about the prophecy of the dates 211 and 212. This is also the exact day, the 27th day of the second month, which Noah finally came out of the ark. Yet again, another perfect match to the Genesis flood story. Even though I knew God had vindicated me, I still didn't feel to put the ministry back up yet. Then, on the morning of March 11th, 2021, I woke up straight away knowing the Lord wanted me to put it back up that day, having no idea at the time it had been exactly 21 days since I put the ministry down on the 19th of February. As I moved forward reflecting on the story, I began to find even more remarkable instances of God's hand of the timing. One, my then 18-year-old son Tyler moved in with me for his first full day on September 25th, 2019. Okay, so today is the big day. It is Wednesday. September 25th, 5.48 in the morning. Tyler is turning 18 years old today. Okay, so it is two o'clock in the morning and we have just made it. Are you excited? Yeah. Here's Tyler coming in his new house for the first time. What do you think, buddy? It's nice. Isn't this cool? Yeah. P's first full day, not with me, was 4-24-2020, exactly seven months to the day. Two. Her green card was printed on February 12th, 2021, exactly nine months and 21 days after she left on 423 and exactly five years to the day God first had told me to move forward on the very first India plane tickets. Five is the number of grace. Wherever you look in the Bible, five is the number of grace. You and I carry that very number on both hands and both feet if we are normal people. And more than that, we have five physical senses. Why? We are made up of fives. God meant for us to be people of grace. Theodore Austin Sparks. And if you weren't convinced already that God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ was behind every detail of my second remarriage and subsequent divorce, perhaps this remaining fact might help. We married on March 24, 2016. After three failed divorce attempts, we were finally legally divorced on August 29, 2021, exactly five years, five months, and five days after our wedding. Five, five, five. Now for the grand finale. What was it that God showed me that day in the woods that brought me to the ground in tears in such dramatic fashion? I already showed you the perfect match to the 40s and 7s in the Genesis flood. And I already showed you the perfect match to the two periods of 150 days. I also already showed you a connection to the 227, the day Noah came out of the ark, and the day God showed me I had been wrong about being totally wrong, which also happened for me on 227. Next, we need to know that one year in the Old Covenant was 360 days, not 365. So the total flood story, not including God telling Noah seven days in advance, lasted from 217, 600 for the 600th year of Noah to 227, 601. That is exactly 370 days. The flood waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days, and they receded from the earth for 150 days, for a total of 300 days. This means Noah stayed in the ark for another 70 days after the waters had receded on day 300. From April 23rd, 2020 to September 20th, 2020, the day Esther the chicken had laid those four other eggs after not laying for 90 days, adding to her first three eggs for a total of seven, happened exactly 150 days after she left our home. The next 150 days ended on February 16th, the day I received the congratulations letter in the mail for her green card. That leaves 70 remaining days in order for it to be a perfect match of the entire flood story in Genesis. February 16th, 2021, was day 300 for me. Plus 70 days is April 27th, 2021. 
So, did God really do this? Was all of this just the craziest coincidences I had ever seen in my life? Or was God going to go the whole way and match every single part of this story to every detail in the Genesis flood account to show that he indeed was behind all of this? So did anything significant happen on April 27, 2021 that would in some way seem to be a spiritual parallel event to Noah finally coming out of the ark to start his new life after all that death? Of course it did. And that's what God used to bring me to the ground in tears that day in the woods in absolute shock and unbelief. September 23rd, 2021, 7.36 in the morning. I mean, when I look at how many things God has done, 70 days later is when God brings Noah out of the ark. You know, that's a really interesting thought. I need to look into and see the time between what that date was that, I, that signified the end of the 300 days and when I actually began to speak to or be connected to Lisa. There, there might very well be something there. I'm not sure I need to look into that and see. Oh my God in heaven, I think I'm gonna pass out. Oh my God in heaven. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh my God, I cannot believe this, Father. I can't believe what my, oh my God, what my eyes just so. Oh man, hope nobody comes out here. So did anything significant happen on April 27th, 2021 that would in some way seem to be a spiritual parallel event to Noah finally coming out of the ark to start his new life after all that death this is one of those moments where your eyes cannot believe what you've just seen. And you just go, there is no way this can happen. And there's no way that the Holy Spirit just gave me this thought. And there's no way you just saw what you saw. April 27th, 2021, just so happened to be the day that I officially asked Lisa to marry me. And the very day she officially said yes a perfect match to the Genesis 7 and 8 flood story. God has literally taken the book of Genesis chapter 7 and 8 and replicated every single date and number that's in that Genesis 7 and 8 and put it in this slash marriage slash divorce slash remarriage story. It ends with Noah coming out of the ark on 227. And that happens to be the very day that God vindicated me in the ministry. As if this were not enough to praise the God of all glory, let me share just a few bonus providences. I first read about Elizabeth Elliot's being widowed and married three times on May 28, 2019. One of the more remarkable details about her life that I had no idea is that she has been married three times. You know, honestly, and I thought to myself, I said, you know what, it was God's will to take away two of her husbands. And I find it and I'm listening to it and it's like listening to all my journal entries. It was just amazing. During that reading, I felt a fearful certainty that I too would lose my second wife and be married a third time. The email that Lisa sent to me, which really captured my attention, was sent to me from New Zealand on March 6th, 2021, exactly 21 months and seven days later. As of right now, 
Lisa and I have found over 15 instances of 21 day time periods in God bringing her and I together and my moving to New Zealand. You can see these and follow the story as it continues in the series, The Grace to Love Again at relentlessheart.com forward slash series. Is there any biblical precedent which may indicate that the number 21 is important to God? If so, is there any possible connection between the 21s in our marriage story so far and the 21s in the Bible? The significance of 21 in the Bible. Number one, 21 is a multiple of two of God's favorite and most used numbers in the Bible, seven and three, both of which are numbers of completion. Two, Daniel mourned and fasted for 21 days. Three, it took God 21 days to answer Daniel's prayer. Four, there are exactly 21 epistles in the New Testament. Five, my favorite book of the Bible, John, has 21 chapters. Six, the book of Hebrews contains 21 references to the Old Testament. Seven, the Feast of Tabernacles ends on the 21st day of the seventh month. Eight, there are exactly 21 dreams in the Bible. Nine, the number 21, or an amount equal to 21, appears exactly seven times in the Bible. 10. Here is where we find an amazing connection between the Bible and our marriage story. In this whole story, God has perfectly matched his timed providences in the Genesis flood to the providences in my apostate spouse and my subsequent remarriage to Lisa. If we remove the metaphorical uses of the word, the word flood appears 21 times in the Bible where the word is used to reference an actual flood. I'd like to leave you with this final thought. Each number you see on this screen right now represents one actual event and a specific time period from the testimony you just heard. There are no duplicates. Please take a moment now to meditate on the power it required from God to control every person, every circumstance, every detail, and even every spirit involved in each one of these events, much more, all of them. For instance, in order for God to determine in advance that he was going to end my first divorce on the 777th day, he had to literally oversee thousands of minute details in hundreds of people's lives including a judge retiring during our trial, people quitting, sick days, traffic signals, car accidents, natural disasters, family emergencies, the schedules of attorneys, the amount of cases brought into the court, and all the personal choices of human will which all involved chose to make along the way. We simply cannot comprehend how much power is at work behind the scenes for God to hit precise days and times like this? To me, there is still no greater display of his power on this earth, not even in the raising of the dead. The day I finished editing all of this video, I discovered a second astonishing connection to March 5th, 2019, the day Persis legally separated from me. The first being 777 days later to the day that I posted the video about letting her go. It turns out the number of days between our Noah's Ark visit on May 9th, 2017 and March 5th, 2019 was exactly 666 days. We still weren't convinced. It thought that could be a coincidence. But when 666 would show up, it got to the point Bob and I could no longer deny that God was talking 
to Michael in a special language that we'd never heard of, and it was through these series of numbers. When I think back to 2002, around about January, as best I can remember, when I had the interaction that I talk about in my autobiography called The Astonishing Grace, The Chief of All Fools, which is a, a free download on RelentlessHeart.com, I tell the story of the angel tapping me on the shoulder, and I turn around and I hear, the Lord will be magnified and glorified through your obedience. And now when I look back on this story, I had no idea that from that point forward, five months later, the gym collapses, but that from that point forward, God was not going to just give me random blessings in response to random obedience, but that he was going to begin to precisely order every detail of my life and events such that it's all perfectly timed in biblically relevant dates or time periods. I had no idea. But from that point forward, God literally has designed every aspect of this life. I mean, if you and I have ever met for coffee at a Starbucks or if we've ever shared a recording together, that was part of his plan and sovereign time and design, knowing that even around that, he was working out this result. And I think back on all the stories in my life where the outcome could have been different had I not precisely obeyed, had I not come out here and heard, stay put, don't hire an attorney even though your parents are begging you to do so and think you're nuts for doing it. I'm gonna do this in 777 days and bring glory to my name. Don't push P out of the house even though I'm allowing demons to manifest in and around her on the 20th of April. No, Deuteronomy 12:32. do not add or take away from what I'm telling you to do three more days from now, I'm going to send her on her way and it will be 40 months to the day that you guys left India and seven months to the day that your son Tyler moved in with you. No, don't wait until tomorrow, the 21st of April, 2021, when you, Jared and Kristen are home and relax to shoot the video. Tell them in the car that you need to go home. And as soon as you do, you need to shoot that video immediately because that happens to be unknown to you at the time, 777 days from the day that P first separated from me in the divorce papers dozens and dozens and dozens of incredible stories. I want to encourage you to go back and listen to all the journal series at relentlessheart.com and listen and, and now filter those times when I you hear me say, oh man, God's telling me to wait. God's telling me to stay put. I don't know how much longer I can go. Oh, the Lord's telling me to move forward, even though it looks impossible. And now filter all of what you hear and see through the fact that the invisible God is reaching through in that moment by his providence, whatever way he chose, to design a precisely timed outcome so that one day you and I could see the incredible power of this God. My brothers and sisters, don't ever let anybody of any kind of faith, whether it be Islam or Buddhist or New Age movement or atheist, which is a, a faith in and of itself, try to convince you that there is more than one God or there is no God. There is only one true God. He is the living God of the Holy Bible. And I would just challenge you to remember if anybody ever tries to challenge you and they try to produce some sort of evidence to cause you doubt in your faith, send them this video and, and ask them, how do you know? And ask them, do they have more evidence of their God and their belief thereof or their belief that he doesn't exist than what they have seen in this video here? They will not be able to show it to you. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance, notice that word, of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. No, these are not fables. No, these were not written by men to control people. These were written by a living God who loves, who saves, who redeems. That the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. If you go through those verses, you'll find the theme is patience, perseverance, endurance. 
the same God yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8, and who's alive today, the great I am, not the great I once was, and he's still at work in people like Michael's life. He still has power. He's making it absolutely obvious. He didn't leave Lisa out of this. To vindicate my remarriage to Lisa, he makes Lisa the day that Noah comes out of the ark. 370 days after the floodwaters came on. After 370 days, you come out and God has this beautiful, beautiful wife waiting for you. Representing life, representing redemption, representing behold, all things are new and everything else died. And here it is. God says to you, just wait, just endure, just stay humble, just stay waiting for me. And in due time, I will lift your head. I will exalt you. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? I hope you will join with me in saying wow and praise God for what you've just seen. The day is going to come when what you've just seen, which I believe really is just a, a small short moment of God's mercy to us in these times of uncertainty all around us to flip over the tapestry of one very perplexing life to give proof that there's an intentional design behind what may look like to a passerby, nothing more than the foolish choices of a, a, a fool or the chaotic work of a devil. And God has just flipped over that tapestry to give us a little bitty glimpse of what he's doing, not just in my life, but in the life of anybody and everybody around the world who has put their faith and hope in Jesus Christ, who recognizes their own weakness and who's drawing daily grace from him in order to live this life, to be an overcomer of the flesh, an overcomer of the world, and an overcomer of Satan. 
all of us who are in Christ and Christ is in us. One day we are going to have this experience where we are blessed to see God flip over and show us all the quote 777s and the 555s, the work of his precise sovereign timing and grace on the other side of our life. We will see that all of it was intentional and all of it has worked for our good. The most important thing I wanna tell you as we end this story is how much I love this God who has so severely afflicted me and disciplined me. To me, what you've just seen is the greatest evidence that I believe you could see anywhere in the world. Scientific proven, time and date proven, digital verified evidence proven, eyewitness proof of the one and only true living God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've just shown it to you in this video. But when I'm out here on the trail walking, I have an evidence that's even greater than that. It's the evidence of who I am in my heart by how he has changed me through the spirit and grace and blood of Jesus Christ. It's an extraordinary evidence that there is only one true God, the God who changes lives and hearts. And I can say with the apostle Paul now that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me, who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, let me just say one thing. Every single person who ever watches this video who has not yet humbled themselves before Jesus Christ, your day is coming. You are going to be humbled. The Bible tells us that every single knee will bow and every single tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord, but it will not be unto eternal life for those. If you do not humble yourself now before this great God, you will be humble, but for all of eternity. If you humble yourself now before this God, Jesus Christ promised the man who humbles himself shall be exalted. The man who exalts himself shall be humbled. One of the most difficult barriers in the whole of the universe to having a fruitful relationship with God and having a hope for eternity and life hereafter is the pride that sits inside of every human heart born in the bosom of Satan, who first exalted himself above God. Humble yourself. Are you willing right now to see that you've just seen a power of God that you've never seen in any video? Oh, you see all kinds of people talking about it and fascinating historical facts and digs over in Jerusalem and microscope evidence and telescopic evidence. You've just seen real life evidence. The arguments stop here. This is not an issue of doctrine. This is an issue of life. You've just been confronted that there is a real God who expects you to really repent, who expects you to really obey and really live. The righteous shall live by faith. What are you gonna do in response to this? Shall you continue to live the way you've gotten? Shall you continue to pretend as if you're not going to die and as if you're not going to, it is appointed for a man to die once and after that to face judgment? I challenge you, if you do not know this God, to humble yourself before him, before it is too late, because if he has to humble you, it will be too late. You have an opportunity here. And may God richly bless those of you who are already in Christ to remember your day is coming. God is gonna flip this whole thing over and you're going to get to see that everything in your life that looks so perplexing and so for naught and so meaningless and so confusing was all an intentional, planned, precise, intricate plan of making you and conforming you into the image of Jesus Christ and preserving you for your inheritance right now being kept in heaven for you that cannot spoil cannot fade and will not perish as you overcome in the grace of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, there is some incredible stuff coming. You have to stick around and see the videos that are coming next. There's been seven new incredible discoveries that I have found while working on this, all precise dates and times you are not gonna wanna miss. Plus, you're not gonna wanna miss all of the insights that are gonna come in the next videos where God gave me a scripture about the meaning and the prophetic meaning of the deer head that you saw me standing out here on this trail holding. There was meaning to that. You also are going to hear the insights God gave me as to why he connected this story to the flood in Genesis. There's a prophetic meaning for all of us in this. You do not wanna miss it. Plus, there's gonna be some incredible teachings that God had me record while I'm out here on this trail that are gonna be a real blessing to all who hear it. Plus, you're gonna wanna see how God eventually eventually gets me to New Zealand and you're gonna to wanna to hear about the absolute impossibility of that ever happening because something new has happened that will prevent me from ever being able to be joined with my beautiful wife, Lisa, in New Zealand unless God does a miracle. And you know he will. Keep watching and you're going to see this another incredible miracle where the God of the impossible does what only he can do. 
By the way, if you did like this video, please hit like. I think in 450 videos, I may have only asked for one. I typically don't do this. I wanna ask you, please do that. It helps YouTube recommend this video to others. Do you know that hundreds of people have sent me emails over the years about trusting God in the storm, preventing them from committing suicide? What might you do to affect somebody's eternal destiny by hitting the like button on this video right now? Maybe pause this video right now and do it before you forget and really help show YouTube that this is a video that needs to be seen. There is no telling what kind of impact you might find out you're pushing a like button might have had when somebody else sees it and changes their life for Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Please also subscribe if you haven't done so, both at Relentless Heart and here, because there's a lot of teachings at Relentless Heart that will never make it on YouTube. For example, the Apostate Bride of Christ. If you haven't seen that, please go start going through the Apostate Bride of Christ. Thank you so much for taking so much of your time to watch this journey with me, to be in awe of our God. And may the Lord bless you as you finish. In Jesus' name, bye-bye.